this is the, the second lecture we're going to have on uh, join algorithms. So remember, last class was hash joins, which I said was the dominant join algorithm that everyone uses. And then today's class is the second major class of uh, join algorithms, which is a sort merge. Again, in a, uh, any real OLAP system that wants to get good performance and never does nested loop joins, it's going to be doing either hash join or sort merge join. But hash joins are definitely more common than the sort merge join. So um, real quick, before we get into the material, uh, there's some dates coming up that you need to be aware of. So as, as a reminder, everyone should be submitting their first code review on uh, this Wednesday. Right? So I sent the email out on Saturday. Every, every group's been teamed up with another group, except for one, which Lynn and I will take care of. Um, and so you need to submit a PR to your, your partner group, and then they have a week to review it and give you feedback. And the idea here is to then go through the, the code review process and to see what it's like to read other people's code and actually try to make sense of it on your own. Because um, this is something that you need to be able to do when you go out into the real world. And then we're also not going to have class on Wednesday. We will meet, uh, everyone will meet with me uh, in my office. I right, send an email also how to sign up. Um, and the idea is that you come for 20 minutes, you talk about the, your current status of your project, uh, what are the problems you're having, what do you need help with, or what, you know, what, what has changed since what you, what you, what you proposed originally. And then on Monday's class next week, so a week from today, uh, it, we'll have the sort of five-minute status update uh, presentations from every group. And we'll go in reverse order than we did before. So Gus will go first. Uh, and then we'll go, again, just one by one. Um, and the idea, again, is to basically tell the group what has changed or what, do you, what have you done so far. OK? Any questions about any of these? OK, cool. All right, so for today's class, uh, we're going to start off talking about the uh, sort of high-level background about uh, SIMD instructions. All right, this is, this is the, sort of the basic material you need to understand how to, we're going to do the sort of vectorized efficient parallel sort merge join algorithm. Um, we'll cover vectorized execution and SIMD in more detail next, next week when you guys read the paper on, uh, we have two lectures on vectorized execution. And then we'll go through the background of the three different uh, parallel sort merge, sort merge join algorithms. Then we'll have an evaluation. And then I'll finish up, if we have time, of just sort of high level tips of what's expected for you uh, when you guys do your, your code review. And so real quickly, before I begin, I will say that during this lecture, sometimes I will say sort merge. Sometimes I, I will say merge sort. Uh, I mean the same thing, and I'll try to keep it as, as sort merge. Because the database people will say sort merge. The algorithm people will say merge sort. All right, but we'll, I'll be, and I'll be clear when something is the merge from the sort versus the merge from the join. Okay? Okay. All right, so everyone here should have probably taken either 418 or 618 or already have an understanding of what, what SIMD is. Um, but again, I just want to go over this at a, at a high level of detail uh, so that you can understand how we're going to do the vectorized uh, bictonic merge sort or bictonic sorting later on. Um, so SIMD is a class of CPU instructions that or allow the processor to do multiple operations, or sorry, a single operation on multiple data items all within a single instruction. So contrast this with the SysD instructions, single instruction, single data item. This is what people normally think of when you think of CPU instructions, where you take, you know, you want to do some simple operation like an addition, you take one register and you add it together with another register and it writes out to a, a third register. Right? That's, that's a SysD because it's a single operation on a, on a single uh, piece of data. Whereas in SIMD, we're going to allow us to perform the same kind of operation, but on multiple data items at, at the same time. So this is not a new idea. Uh, there's a, a famous work in the 1960s called Flynn's Taxonomy of Parallel CPU Architectures. So SIMD and SysD were one of the ones back in the 1960s uh, that people had thought about. But it really didn't kind of come into vogue or come uh, to the forefront of what we can get now in, in modern CPUs until like the 1990s when AMD and Intel put out their own CPUs that each had uh, uh, updated microarchitectures to support SIMD. So for Intel, the first version of, of their SIMD instructions was called MMX. Then AMD came out with something a little bit later called uh, 3D Now. Um, in the case of Intel, MMX actually doesn't mean anything. Intel explicitly says it doesn't mean anything. Uh, people claim it means multimedia extensions, right? But that, but in the legal proceedings, they explicitly say MMX does not mean anything. Um, and you also see this sometimes in other Intel, uh, you know, release names or code names for their products, right? 
The latest, latest ones are Xeons. You have like Coffee Lake, KB Lake, Sky Lake. Intel is paranoid about getting sued, uh, but people claiming that Intel took their names. So in the case of those lake things, those are all physical lakes somewhere in the United States. So you can't claim that they stole your name because it's a geographical region. Same thing for MMX. They just claim that, oh, it's just three, three letters put together. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, and that was good enough. So uh, the first versions of the SIMD instructions, though, were actually really, really bad. Uh, so they only had 64-bit uh, registers, and they could only do operations on integers. And they had this weird thing where you couldn't, uh, you couldn't do uh, floating point operations and SIMD integer operations at the same time. You had to switch the CPU into like a different mode. Um, so they were difficult to program. Later on, uh, Intel released the, the, the SSC instructions, and then now we're up to AVX instructions. These are much better, and these are actually allow us to do uh, more complex things, not just because we have larger registers, but also because there's more operations that these things are going to support. So, I mean, I remember when I was in middle school, we had a Pentium CPU back in the day, and Intel would put out these ads saying, like, oh, you know, now with MMX, we didn't know what it meant. We just knew we wanted it because it sounded cool. Um, but most of, the, most of the software at the time didn't actually support it. Right? But now with um, compilers have gotten better, the, the, the software has gotten better. And now with the new instructions, there are some uh, things that can take advantage of it. All right, so let's go through a real high-level example. Again, we'll cover SIMD in more detail uh, uh, in the next lecture. Uh, but for now, this, this will be enough for us to understand what's going on. So let's say that I want to add uh, two vectors together, x plus y, and I want to put the output in a, in, a, in a third vector called z. So the way we would write you know, our, our C code to actually do this uh, would essentially just be a for loop, again, assuming that x and y had the same, the same length, and then for every element in position i and x and every element in position i for y, again, we add these two together, and we, we get our output buffer here. So the way you would actually implement this in uh, and your C code is like this. And the way, most of the time, if you're not doing SIMD, actually, if you're not doing SIMD, the way you would actually execute this is with, through a SysD instruction, which is literally just, again, looping through one by one each of these elements, adding it together, and then producing the output, right? So this is, uh, you know, th there's, there's no optimization really we can do to speed this up other than maybe unrolling the loop. Right? We're still going to have to take two elements and run a single instruction to produce a single output. So now with SIMD, the way this is going to work is that we're going to take a, uh, sort of a run or multiple elements together and, write the, and copy them out into a SIMD register. So the way to think of a SIMD register, it's a special location uh, that we can sort of get exposed to us as if it's a variable where we can write, out, uh, write, write data into. And then we can write code to, to say, invoke the SIMD instruction on, uh, on, on these registers uh, in the, these different locations. So in this case here, we'll take the first four elements and put it into one for, the, for x and put it into this register. We take the first four, four, first four elements of the y vector and put it in this one. So in this example here, um, assuming we have 32-bit numbers or 32-bit keys we want to we uh, uh, add together, then we can put these in a 128-bit register, a SIMD register. We can put four of these 32-bit keys, right? We'll see this later on for the newer SIMD instructions, or the newer SIMD uh, instruction sets. They're going to have much wider registers, and they'll be able to support floats and, and, and other, other data types. All right, so now when we want to add these together these two, these vectors, essentially what's going to happen is it's going to take the first element here and the first element here, add them together, and do this for all the other ones, and write it out to... Uh, another SIMD register where we can put Z here. Right? And this one has to be also 128 bits. Right? So then we get down and do the next four, same thing. We feed them and uh, we put them into our SIMD registers. We add them together, and it produces our uh, output in our SIMD register. Yes? What's the difference between this and a GPU? His question is, what is the difference between this and a GPU? Um, I mean, the GPU has a lot of little cores. And, they can, and they're, they're sort of a limited instruction set, so they're not like a, a full general purpose C, CPU like a Xeon would be. So there's a limited number of operations you can do, do on them. Now, within the core themselves, they could have SIMD instructions, right? But, and that would be what they would be doing here. So the GPU is going to give you a lot of cores that can do a lot of the different things at the same time. This is now within a single core. We use the SIMD to speed things up. 
we'll cover uh, man, we'll cover GPUs and databases at the end of the semester. Yes. Say it again. The, sorry. So his question is: the width of the register determines how many elements we can put into it. Yes, in the units. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yes, so in this case here, again, I'm assuming I have 128-bit registers, and I have 32-bit keys, so I can put four of them in there. So everything has to be aligned nicely based on the, the type. You have to align the data based on the operation, you're gonna, the, your instruction you're going to perform on it. So in this case here, I'm doing uh, a SIMD addition on 32-bit integers, so I have to line them up to be you know, one after another. right? If I had, say, a 48-bit integer, that would cause problems because the instruction is expecting everything to be 32 bits, and you, you won't get the correct result. So yeah, so the, the, the latest version of, of SIMD, I think, is, AV, is, is AVX512, and they can support, I think, 8-bit, 16-bit, 32- and 64-bit uh, SIMD additions, right? So it should be obvious why this is, this is a big win for us, because before, when I did this in the SISD way, I was adding these uh, numbers one by one, so I had eight numbers here, so I had to do eight addition instructions. Or, or eight. In the case of the SIMD case, I only had to do two uh, instructions, right? So that was a 4x improvement. Now, you also may be saying, oh, don't you have to copy the data out from memory and put it into the, the, the SIMD registers? You have to do that anyway for SISD, right? You have to take it out of the CPU cache and put it into the, the register in order to do the addition. We're just not showing that extra step. Right? But just in terms of straight addition operations or addition instructions, you know, we had a 4x reduction in the number of operations we have to do. So the advantage of SIMD is that we get significant performance gains uh, if our algorithm can be vectorized in such a way where we can express it in terms of SIMD instructions. And then just how exactly you write these vectorized or SIMD instructions in your algorithms, we'll cover that uh, in, in a week from now. But the disadvantage is that, uh, as we'll see, implementing an algorithm to, uh, to take advantage of SIMD is still, by most, most accounts, a very manual process. So the Intel has the best compilers. They have a special compiler that can help uh, try to vectorize code. And for simple things like you know, for loop iterating over two vectors and adding them together, the compiler can figure that out. But for more complex things we want to do in our database system, like a join, uh, it's not going to be able to automatically figure that out. And then we, as the highly paid and highly skilled database developers, we have to write that ourselves. And again, we'll, we'll see this uh, in the next paper you guys read from, from Columbia. They basically show how to take every possible relational algebra operator and make a SIMD version of it. Um, but the, the dirty secret of it, none of it actually works if it doesn't fit in your cache. But we'll get that later. All right. The, uh, as sort of he asked before, also like SIMD could have restrictions on data alignment. So if you're, the data you're trying to do an operation on does not fit into the predefined lengths that the SIMD instruction set specifies, then you, ha you can't use this uh, very easily. And the last one is gathering data into the SIMD registers and then breaking them up or scattering them back into memory after we do our operations on, on that can be tricky. Um, and it may not be efficient but depending on what CPU you are using. So we'll see this again next class. I think it's either the, the gather or the scatter operation uh, on the hardware they were running on. The, the CPU didn't actually support that instruction in, the, in, in SIMD, so they had to emulate it with, with assembly, and that ended up being uh, more, uh, less efficient. But again, the main thing here is that, this, that it's just not like there's a magic O, you know, O12 flag being passed to GCC to go go vectorize everything. We're gonna have to write our code carefully to make this work. Yes. And also, if you have each like branch, then they may hurry through. Yeah. So he also, yeah. So his comment also too is like, if you have a conditional uh, in in your code, that's gonna cause problems in when when you when, and then the compiler tries to vectorize things. And we'll see this when we do our sorting. We try to get rid of the if if clauses, and that allows us to do everything entirely in SIMD. Again, I, I, I just want to sort of, I don't know how much, how much you guys already know about SIMD. I don't know whether 618, 14 has covered this yet. This is just the bare minimum you need to understand the, the parallel sort merge algorithm we'll talk about today. But then we'll cover this in more detail in, in, in the next, next lecture. Okay. So uh, for sort merge, the basic algorithm looks like this, right? Uh, 
In the first phase, you do uh, you sort both the inner table and the outer table based on the join key. And then on the second phase, you actually do the merge, where you just basically have this iterator that scans through both the, the, the sort of relations, and then you just compare the results with each other. And the nice thing about it is that you only have to take one pass over the outer table. You may have to go do multiple passes on the inner table if there are duplicates. So visually, it looks like this, right? So we have our relation R, relation S, right? And then so the first phase of the sort merge is you just sort. And I'm just showing a box here that says sort. I'm not defining what algorithm we're using, whether it's quick sort, heap sort, or the botanic sorting stuff we'll talk about later. It doesn't matter. Uh, and then now we have our two relations that are sorted. And then in the merge phase, again, we just have an iterator on each side. And then they just go scan down and do the comparisons with, with each other. right? And the idea here is that because you know everything's in sorted, in sorted order, if you get to a key here, uh, in, in the inner table, and as you're scanning through in the iterator, if you exceed that key, all right, if the value of this key is less than the value in this key, then you know you need to stop here because there's nothing else down below that could ever possibly join with it. Right? So at a high level, this is pretty easy to understand. But when we actually want to make this fast in a in-memory system, uh, things get a bit more tricky. And the key observation to make about how we can speed this up is that the the sorting is always going to be the most extensive part of the sort merge. Um, and so we're really going to focus on what we can do to, to speed that up. And just like before, when we talked about hash joins, where we had to identify what, what our hardware actually looks like and what its properties are in order to get the best performance, we need to do the same thing in order to make our, our, our join algorithm work efficiently here. Right? So that means that we're going to have to try to utilize as many CPU cores as possible so everything's running in parallel. Um, we want to be mindful of where the data is actually being stored or that we're accessing so that we try to maximize the local access based on our NUMA region. So we don't want a core have to go read data from, from some other uh, socket because it has to go over the interconnect. And then where possible, we want to try to take advantage of SIMD uh, because we'll, we'll, it's another way for us to, to, to maximize the parallelism at a single core and get better performance. Yes? Yes, it's a good question. I was, but I was just about to say this. So his, his statement is, I'm making a big deal about SIMD for the for the sort merge join, but is it also the case that you can you can vectorize and use SIMD for the hash join? Yes, we will show that. Uh, I will say it actually doesn't help, All right? Um, but that but that's a good point, and we'll, we'll cover that uh, next class. All right, so. The one thing I'll say, though, and we'll see this later on, is that uh, the, the way that Hyper used to do their joins was, was with, through uh, sort merge. And their sort merge join algorithm actually ignored this point for the merge phase. So they're going to argue that uh, in, in their case, as you'll see in a second, they're going to do all the merging doing sequential scans uh, at, at each thread on the, on the inter internet side or inner table side. So in that case, if you're doing sequential scans, the hardware prefetcher can prefetch the data for you, and you don't care about numer boundaries or numer regions because the, 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 the hardware prefetcher hides those, those additional latencies. That's what they claim. We'll see in the results. It doesn't actually work out. Um, and then they eventually gave up on the sort merge join algorithm. Right? They, they use a hash join for everything. All right. So the, the parallel version of this, looks again, looks a lot like the hash join, where we can have an additional optional phase as, as in the beginning that we, we can petition the outer table and assign them to workers and cores. Um, and then we have, again, the same thing that we had before, where we have the sort, sort and the merge phases separately. And again, these, all of these phases we're going to be able to run in parallel. So for the partitioning phase, uh, there isn't really anything to say about this that's different than the, the hash join partitioning. Um, I'll just define uh, partitioning a little bit further and say, and I should have mentioned this last class, there's essentially two types of partitioning we can have. There's the implicit partitioning, which would be as the data is loaded in, we do hash partitioning or we split it up based on, its, on some attribute in the table, and we assign tuples to uh, numer regions or blocks or morsels based on that. So if we now have a, uh, a join query, that wants to do the join on tables that are already partitioned on, on, on how we split them up when we loaded the data in, 
then we don't need to do any explicit partitioning. The data is already uh, divided nicely for us already, right? But this is this is this can happen. It's not common because oftentimes the queries show up and they want to join on something that uh, you would it was unexpected. And so whatever partition you have before doesn't help you. The, the Radix stuff that we talked about last time, are, this is an example of explicit partitioning, where we don't care how the data was maybe divided up before. We're going to take a pass on it and split it up and divide it and partition it to, in preparation of doing our, our join algorithm. So again, for this, you can use the same Radix, Radix partitioning approach that we talked about last time. But as I said, as far as I know, no major in-memory database system actually does this because the overhead of taking this, this first pass to partition the data is, it does not improve the performance significantly to, to warrant this. So again, we, but we can make the same design choice in, the, uh, in our sort, sort merge join algorithm. All right, so what we want to do is actually focus more on actually the sorting phase because again, this is the, always going to be the most expensive part in this process. So in the sorting phase, the idea, the high-level goal is that we want to create these runs that are that are represent sort of these sorted chunks or segments of the of the both the inner relation, inner table, and the outer table. And the idea is that we're going to make do this sort of incrementally, where we start off with really small runs, right? In our example, we'll just have four elements or four keys, and then we'll progressively make larger and larger sort of runs um, until we eventually we have we have a globally sorted list. So we'll sort of end up with these, start off with these locally sorted lists, and then we combine two locally sorted lists together to make a larger locally sorted list, and then once we combine everything together, now we have a globally sorted list. So the thing that uh, I want to stress in this lecture is that when, when everything was just, when, it, when, we, when we were talking about uh, disk-based database systems, where we said the disk was always the most sensitive thing, uh, usually quick sort was, was, was good enough if everything just made it into memory. Right? But now if you want to do this in parallel and we, and we want to be aware of our hardware, underlying hardware, quick sort is not going to be good enough and we need to do something more, more complicated. Right? So the technique we're going to use to sort uh, that was in the, uh, it wasn't in the paper that you guys read but they did rely on this, is uh, this thing called cache con conscious sorting. So this came from this, the paper that I mentioned last class from Intel and Oracle from 2009 where they showed how you can take advantage of modern hardware and do some basic fundamental uh, database operations um, more efficiently. Right? So a lot of times the Intel papers are really, really good, especially the ones at least in database conferences, because you know, Intel's in the hardware business. Right? They, they want to make money selling hardware, and uh, they can't really watch, uh, keep in incrementing the clock speed anymore because silicon melts and there's other problems. So they start throwing in a bunch of new features like SIMD and other accelerators and, and a large number of cores as a way to get better performance. But if this thing, these things are so complicated that nobody knows how to get better performance out of them, uh, then you know, no one's going to buy the hardware. So Intel puts out some really good papers and shows that like, here's how to actually use the hardware correctly. So this is an example of one of them where they, can, they show how to do sorting efficiently uh, using SIMD. So, the terminology I'm going to use in describing this cache conscious sorting algorithm is doesn't actually come from the original the Intel paper. Uh, they don't use the term levels. This is something I'm going to use because uh, it helped me to understand what the hell they're, they're actually doing. Um, and it's important to differentiate this between the phases of the join algorithm, uh, which, which technically right now we're, we're in the sorting phase. So the way to think about how this cache con conscious sorting is going to work is that they're going to break up the, the sorting algorithm into three different levels. And at each level, you're going to deal with data runs or runs of data that are at a certain size. And then you're going to do your sorting in a certain way. And then as your runs get larger and larger, you end up with, a, with another level where you want to do sorting in another way. And at some point, you now exceed your CPU caches. And at the last level, uh, you, you do this out of cache uh, sorting. So the, the way we're going to start off is that in level one, we'll do in-register sorting. So it'll be where everything can fit into a single SIMD register. And then once we, do, once we sort all of our, our entire data set in this way, then we get down to level two, where we now start combining the output of level one uh, into sorted runs that can fit in our CPU caches. And we'll keep doing this incrementally until our, uh, our sorted runs are one half our cache size, so like L3 cache size. You want to take a guess why we have to do this? 
Why does it have to be half the size? Input and output, right? So, so we can't do in place sorting. We'll, we'll take a sorted run, we, we sort it, and then we write it out to uh, an, another uh, sorted run location. And that, so we have to make sure that everything, both the input and the output fit in cache, so our input can only be half the size. And then at some point, when we exceed this list limitation, then we come to the last level and we do our in cache sorting. So pictorially, it looks like this. Again, we start off with our unsorted run. In level one, we, do, uh, we generate these sorted runs that, that fit in our, our CIMD registers. Then in level two, we start combining these guys together to progressively larger and larger uh, sizes until they are one half the size of our L3 cache. And then at level three, we just start merging all these things together until we have a globally sorted run at the bottom. Right? And if we're, doing, if we're doing joins on really large tables, this will exceed our uh, CPU caches. But we can try to come up with a technique in level three that balances cache misses with instructions. Okay? So we're going to go through each of these levels one by one. So the first level is my favorite level uh, because the idea is an old one, um, but it's really kind of cool to see how it actually works on, on modern hardware. So in the first level, they're going to use a technique called sorting networks. So this comes from the 1940s uh, where people proposed about how to build actual uh, hardware to do sorting. All right? um, and so the way it works is that we're going to build this network that has these wires that's going to go from the input to the output. So say, in this case here, we have, a, uh, we have four keys we want to sort. And so these wires represent the sort of thing of these wires is carrying the value that is coming is, you know, that, from its source. So this, this wire here carries value 9. This one carries 5, 3, and 6. And then what will happen is the wires will get uh, joined together with these comparators that are essentially going to do a min and max operation. So what will happen is, in this case here, 9 and 5 get fed into this comparator. So the min value will get put onto the top. The max value will get put into the bottom. So in this case here, 5 goes to the top, 9 goes to the bottom. And then the, the, now the value that's on this wire comes from, from whatever was the result of this comparator operator. All right, so same thing here for 3 and 6. 3 goes, goes to the top, 6 stays at the bottom. And then again, they feed now into the next comparator. This one will be 5 and 3. 3 goes to the top, 5 goes to the bottom. Now in this case for 3, it doesn't have any comparators on its wire, so it writes out the value to the, out the output buffer here. So 3 gets pushed out to the end. And then so we keep doing this for all the other compar comparators on the wire until we, ended up, until we end up with a uh, sorted array of our original keys. Right? Yes? Is it wrong so we're not even there. So his question is, are we running on CPU cache? Is it, like, this is just a high-level diagram of what we're doing. We haven't actually, we haven't defined, we didn't describe how we're actually going to implement those yet. That's next. So the, as he said earlier, um, SIMD only really works well if we have no uh, conditionals or if branches. So the, the key thing to understand about this is that no matter what set of inputs we give it, it's always going to execute the same instructions to sort these four keys. Right? It's always going to do the same min and max. It doesn't care what the values are. Right? It just knows that I execute this instruction to get the min, I execute that instruction to get the max. So we can implement this really efficiently on a modern CPU because there's, again, there won't be any if branches as you would have in like a quick sort algorithm. Right? It doesn't say like if 5 is greater than 9, do this, otherwise do that. It always says, all right, take this value and this value, run min and max, and whatever the output is, I don't care what it is, write it out to, to this location. So this is really efficient to do on a modern CPU, like, a, like an Intel Xeon, because these are super scalar CPUs with really large uh, uh, instruction pipelines. So if you have a branch mesh prediction because of an if, if clause, then the CPU is going to flush out your instruction pipeline and then it's going to be a really expensive operation to go fetch the next the actual instructions you, you do need and bring them into uh, in, into the CPU. Whereas in this case, because we have no conditionals, we know exactly what instructions we're going to execute every single time we we do this uh, run. Yes. Is that done by like a single instruction? Because uh, if you compare numbers, don't you want to say like if five is less than nine, we put five here? You're asking. Yeah, why we don't need like if branch, or is it just not my single instruction? So we'll see. We'll see in the next slide. But like, take take this first first comparator. 
I have two inputs, nine and five. The one instruction says take the min, write it here. The, the next, second instruction takes the max, put it there. So that's it's provided by a single instruction uh, after like a No, this will be, you have to do two instructions, min and max, to do that. Let, let me walk through the example in, in SIMD and, and see if it makes sense. I think, I think his question was, uh, if you want to do min, you would have to do some base condition inside the min. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean yeah. in the assembly level, you would have to like compare two numbers and then uh, in the case of SIMD, and there's min and max uh, instructions, right? So you can just do that in a single operation. All right, so let's see how we do this now uh, in SIMD. So for this, we're not going to sort a, it's a single, single run at the same time. We're actually going to do a, a, a four by four comparison. So the, the first thing we always have to do is we have to do a load and put these, uh, and put, you know, put the, the data that's in our CPU caches, put it into our, into our registers. But now when we want to do our sorting, we're not going to sort within a single register because that's not how SIMD works. Like SIMD, you can't say, take the first element in my register and take the second element and do something to them. I can only take, I can only do operations across registers, right? So in this case here, I'm going to sort, you know, within a column for each of these here, right? So to do this, I can just do 10 min and max instructions uh, that I just talked about to end up with a, uh, the, the sort of registers like this. But the problem is now we see that the, 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 the sorting, again, is through the column, not, through, not within a single register. So if I want to put this now back in, into CPUs, or CPU memory or DRAM, i got to do uh, you know, a bunch of extra mem copies to go grab the actual things I need and put it into uh, a line data region. But luckily, there are trans transposed operations or instructions for SIMD that we essentially can do uh, some shuffles to end up with taking what's in this column here and putting it now into a single CMB register. And then now I can copy this thing out uh, and put it just in some location in memory, again, as, as a sorted run. So it's not globally sorted, right? Like eight is, 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 is greater than five, but five is over here. So, but again, at level one, all we wanna do is just take our Take you know take their keys that can fit into a single register and then do our sorting on that. So in the case of AVX five twelve, the latest version of um, of the SIMD instructions on Xeon, we can only we can only sort four keys at the same time, at least in a database system, because our tuple IDs are always going to be sixty four bits, and we assume we have sixty four bit uh, um, keys. Then our the actual element we want to sort is going to be one hundred twenty eight bits. So we can only sort four 120-bit keys at a time. Um, so even though we have larger registers, we're still going to do four. We're still going to use this uh, sorting, sort, uh, sorting network approach. All right. So again, the main thing to show here is that with 26 instructions, uh, I can sort uh, four, four, have four sorted runs, whereas if it was quick sort, it would be much more expensive because, again, there's conditionals, there's a whole bunch of other things that would be going on if you had to write this in, in, in a, in a SISTI, um, SISTI program. All right, so now, once, now at this point, we have all of our sorted runs that, that fit in our SIMI registers. Now we want to go down to level two and now uh, merge these guys together and generate larger sorted runs. If they're still being locally sorted, right, it's not the global list, but we want to generate larger and larger ones. And as I said, we'll do this incrementally until our uh, sorted runs are half our cache sizes. So this technique comes from, again, another Intel paper. This is actually a precursor to the, to the paper from, from the, from the, I just talked about before. Um, and this is purely about how to do uh, sorting on a on multi-core CPU. And I think this paper is a big deal because it shows how you can take a, you know, existing old ideas and speed them up on, on, on modern hardware, right? So, Intel talks about how they can speed up their, their, their sorting algorithm by up to 3.5x over a SISTI implementation, right? This, this is actually really impressive because when you think about it, how old is quicksort, right? Before I was born, from the 1970s, right? And there's no magic algorithm unless P equals NP that's going to make these sorting algorithms go faster. So just purely based on imp careful engineering and, and, and performance tuning, uh, they can get a 3.5x speed up over... Uh, to uh, you know, a, a well-written quicksort algorithm, and that's to me that's 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 really impressive, and that shows the advantage of what SIMD uh, can do. So 
the way this level two stuff is going to work is that they're going to build what's called a Bitonic merge network. And the idea here is that they're essentially going to look a lot like a sorting network, um, but we're going to do some slightly different and have some extra steps in order to deal with larger and larger uh, sorted runs. So at a high level, it looks like this. So we're going to take two sorted runs and merge them together and produce our new output. So in this case here, we're just going to take, say, two, uh, two four-element or four-key sorted runs and merge them together. And so what it needs to happen is the, the first sorted run is going to be listed in, in the same order that it was when, when it came out of the level one sorting process. So it's going to have the lowest to highest. But the, the second sorted run is actually being in reverse order. So it's going to be from the highest to lowest. And the reason why we do this is because when we do our comparisons, we want to know that the highest value uh, that's in, in this one here is whether that's less than or equal to the, the lowest value from this other one. So as you can see, we're essentially doing a bunch of min and maxes again, just like as, as we did before, which we can implement entirely in SIMD. And then we do some more shuffling to put the data around in, in the right position that we want them to be. Uh, and we do this three times, and then we end up with our uh, sort of run out output here. So... I'm not going to show you again exactly the details of how this algorithm works. It's same, if you understand how the sorting network works, you can see how to, again, how to extrapolate it by just doing more stuff to, to get it into the form that we want it to be. Yes? Does the half catch size suggest that like, the atomic network just perform on half with few caches? Say it again? Uh, does like, uh, half catch size suggest the atomic uh, network just perform on CPU caches? So, so his, his statement is, um, because we're requiring that the size of the input has to be half the cache size, yeah. do we assume that all these instructions and operations will be performed entirely in CPU cache? Yeah. Yes. Then, like, where is level one? Where is level one performed? Yeah. Uh, what, what do you mean? Since, like, it's performing in CPU cache, and level one is performing a space that is, like, smaller than level two. Yes, yeah, CMD registers. Like, you, like, if you have your program run entirely in registers, that's ridiculously fast. Yeah. But you can't, right? So, again, we're, we're dealing with larger and larger data sets, and we need to use larger and larger me memory locations. And as you get larger, they get slower because they get more expensive. So, at the very first beginning, you just partition the data sets in very small places. Like, and I, don't, I don't use the word, you use the word partition. You just take four keys put them in a SIMD register and do the sorting network sort, right? Does It doesn't matter, yeah. And then now you're basically just grabbing random uh, sorted runs from the previous level and then using the, the, the Batonic merge network to make them larger and larger until you, your, your output size, your input size exceeds your CPU cache. So each block here represents a SIMD register? Each block here is just a key. Together, this is this, so I'm showing uh, uh, taking two sorted runs from level one and merging them together. If you want to now have a sort like eight elements with another eight element one, you have to have an even larger Batonic uh, uh, merge network. So here shows like two reg CMD registers to uh, merge, merge the two. Yeah, they're merged. Like you can do, you can do in this case here, you can do this part in, in, in SIMD. Um, but at some point, it, you can't get everything in SIMD. It, is, it makes everything larger and, and wider. Okay. So, so we can use the um, the Batonic merge networks to get again to our to, to get our uh, sorted runs up to a certain size. But then, when we exceed our CPU cache, then we're going to hit uh, level three, where we're going to do what's called multi-way merging. And the idea here is essentially we're just going to use the more Batonic merge networks. Um, but we're going to split up the, the actual sorting process itself to, to combine all these things into, um, into larger sorted runs. And the way we're going to do this is break up our pipeline so that within uh, I don't know, a single core, instead of having it sort of, all right, I'm going to sort everything for this, this, these bunch of inputs, and then switch over now to sort the next, for the next bunch of inputs, you can actually have the thread jump around and do different steps of the, of the sorting process. Um, and that ends up getting uh, better performance because you're not just switching the CPU into this mode of like, 
all right, let me, let me be CPU bound and crunch all this data, and then I'm done, and let me go try to fetch a bunch of data in from my memory and bring in my CPU caches, let me crunch on that. You have this sort of balance of, of because you're jumping around, where I can do a bunch of work, and then while the memory controller fetches some stuff, and then when I'm done that, then the data I need is ready, so then I'll go work on that while I fetch more things. We'll see in a second what I mean by this, but like the idea is that instead of just having the CPU go uh, sort of all in CPU, you know, CPU bound, all in memory bound, and just oscillating back and forth, we can pay a little extra penalty from having additional instructions to jump around our, our pipeline, but in the end, it, it balances out, and, and we're using our, our hardware more uniformly. All right, so well, this is going to require more bookkeeping for us um, because we need to know when a thread is allowed to actually do something uh, at a particular step in the pipeline. But again, this is this is this is in in the end, this can be better for us. And I'll say too, also, we're going to do this in parallel at, at all the different CPUs uh, and the worker threads. I'm just going to show the example how to do it within a single thread. But then everybody's essentially doing the same thing. But they're only processing the data that's 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 sort of assigned to them. So we don't need to synchronize across threads, uh, and we can use lo uh, we can use lockless queues and everything. All right. Yes. Uh, I didn't understand the Pythoning network. Where is it exactly done? Is it on the CPU side or on the? I mean, is it on the normal CPU side or the all CPU side? Uh, so you can do you can do the min max stuff in the uh, in SIMD registers, okay. right? You can if because again, like in this case here, right? So I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing four comparators, right? So for this example here, so B1 needs to do min and max on A4, B2 needs to do min and max on uh, B3. So I can put these elements into SIMD registers, do the two the min max instructions that produce the output, right? Where it gets tricky now is if you have larger sorted runs, then you may may not be able to do SIMD for all that. And the shuffle thing again, as it gets larger, there's not gonna be you can't use SIMD for that. So in this case here, it's going to be as it gets larger, it's SISTI, but you're doing it in parallel across different threads. Yes? Just a thought that, well, it looks like it doesn't even actually have to run on SIMD. You can probably produce specialized hardware just for this. Okay, uh, so his statement is, this doesn't look like you have to use the SIMD. You can produce specialized hardware to do this. So again, that was the original idea of sorting networks from the 1940s, right? Like when they say wires, they literally mean wires that someone would put together to do sorting of things, right? Um, it's super expensive to, to fab hardware, right? So no one's going to do that for sorting. Okay. Okay. So uh, yes, you're probably true. You could you could bake this into, you could bake the the sorting the the sorting network into hardware. But again, for these larger larger, larger runs, it's not going to work. Right. I I had just had somebody tell me once that like um, man, I, I'm I'm gonna go on a tangent here, but what's gonna be really interesting with uh, fabbing hardware in the future is that you know it costs billions and billions of dollars to to build this new like a new plant, right? And you know Intel's I think pushing like 10 nanometers now or, or nine nanometers, but there's still all these fabs you know in 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 Asia that can do like 70 nanometers. And in some ways they're sort of idle. So like it doesn't cost that much money in quotes, like you know, a couple of tens of thousand dollars, maybe hundred thousand dollars to go fab a one-off uh, chip in these like 70 nanometer labs or fabs that are just idle anyway. So maybe in the future that if you have some crazy idea that you want to come up with a hardware accelerator for, it wouldn't be that much to try it out. Again, I'll mention this next class. We are actually having a hardware accelerated database seminar series in the fall. But it's mostly going to be GPU stuff. Yes. Okay, so if the max run size is half the cache size, so that like at the very end you're going to merge like two runs that are like each a quarter of the cache size. Yes. But, so then like how does that relate to the SIMD stuff? Because like if your cache is really big, like a quarter of the cache size could be like much larger than a SIMD. Right? So his question is, how does the how does the cache size limitate or the, the sort of run size has to be a quarter of the cache size? Yeah. It will get up to that. Yeah, it'll get up to that. How does that relate to, to the SIMD stuff? Yeah. So the within the sort of run, you're doing again these sort of comparison comparators between the uh, some you know some element from the first sort of run, some element from the second sort of run. So for them, you you can combine a bunch of things together 
that you know you're always going to have to do because it's, it's always with the same set of instructions every single time. You don't care what the actual values are. And then you just run the, the SIMD instructions for those. Then they produce the output. So if I had more, if, I, if my runs were larger here, I would have more comparators and I would have more shuffle phases. And so I, again, I think for, for the min-max stuff, you can definitely use SIMD. For the shuffle one, it may not be able the case. Like, but it could be possible that like everything in the first, like in the first run, is actually smaller than everything in the second run. His question is: everything in the first, it may be the case that everything in the first run yeah. could be smaller than the second run. Yeah. So could you do like a simple like well, check? I just don't see what's like this too confusing because you're taking like half each line and somehow the output will have like we can talk about. This is, this is not half a run. This is the full run. Uh, okay. Right? So this, is, so this is this would be the first time you invoke this Platonic merge network from level two. You're you're dealing with four element sort of runs from the from level one. Okay. And then now this again, all these four elements will be sorted sorted here. Question back. Yeah, does the SIMD register have to be loaded in from contiguous memory? His question is, does SIMD register have to be loaded in from contiguous memory? Uh, I don't think it has to be, no. But it'd be expensive because it's multiple load operations. So that, again, we'll cover this. I don't, I don't spend too much time on the SIMD stuff. We'll cover this uh, in, in the next class. Making SIMD work requires you to sort of like problem solve and figure out, well, what's the, what's the, the SIMD primitives I can use? How do I get my data into the right form so that I can just load it in without having to do like a for loop to go coalesce a bunch of stuff together? And there's other cool tricks we'll, we'll talk about of like, uh, you can use like lookup maps to say, you know, how to jump to the right offset to find the thing you need. There's a bunch of cool tricks you can do to make SIMD actually work efficiently. But you're right, if you do the slowest thing is like do random access to pack in your register, then that's gonna, that, that might just negate the, the benefit you get. Okay. Um, Right, so, so this is the multi-way merging. Uh, so this is this is the this is level three. This is a single thread. So here's all our sort of runs from level two, and then basically we're just gonna keep doing merges uh, to produce larger and larger uh, uh, sort of runs, and then we start writing them out to these queues. And as I said, there's a single thread we have, and it has this extra bookkeeping uh, infrastructure in place so that it knows what the size of each queue and it knows whether uh, there's work to be done at these merge operators. So in this case here, when we first start, there's nothing to be done at this merge because our queues aren't full. And then likewise, there's nothing done over here. But then let's say as we do our merge, we start feeding into these queues. And at some point, we have enough uh, data into our queues where we can go ahead and actually now start merging things. So the thread would say, aha, there is actually a task for me to do here. So it could have been doing a merge down here. Then all of a sudden it says, I now have work over there, and it jumps over here and does the merge and produces more output. So this seems bad, right, given that everything I talked about before about uh, maintaining, you know, you want to maximize your use of the CPU cache. But then the idea here is that, yes, you'll be paying a penalty of having cache misses, but essentially having a context switch jumping from some task down here to some task up here. Uh, but the idea here is that rather than just having the, the, the system sort of Take as much data as you can and, and sort it, and then produce the output, and then and then go get more data and produce the output. Right? That's essentially having this ping pong effect of like pulling data in from 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 memory into your caches, processing it, and then pulling more memory. Right? The idea is that you, you could recognize that all right, well maybe I can uh, start pulling the data over here, bring it to my CPU caches while I'm crunching something over here, and then when this is ready, then I can jump over here and and then process that. Again, the idea is that we just sort of balance things out uh, and make, make this, the, the, the access patterns more uniform. And then we end up getting better performance, although we, are, uh, we may have more cache misses. We'll have ca less cache delays. Yes? So this, is this a picture of what the single core is doing? Or what this is what a single core is doing, yes. And so, so uh, how could it make progress, would it, would it just be the memory, it could make progress in the sense that like the me uh, memory system could be pulling in data while it's uh, computing, doing comparisons around? Well? Yeah, so his question is, how could we be making progress on this? Uh, we can, yeah, because we can have the, the system know that, all right, 
I'm maybe doing something down here, but then I want to go up here next, so I'll start bringing things to my CPU caches, right? I, I just need to bring the first pieces, right? So that when I jump here, it's ready for me, and then I can get the, the rest of the stuff, start bringing the CPU caches from the, either harbor, from the harbor prefetching or software prefetching. So in the end, we'll see this when we see the experiments. We're going to have, uh, we're going to end up using less cycles, although we could have more cache misses. Okay. So then we get to the merge phase. And as I said in the beginning, there's not really any uh, magic to make the merge phase go fast. Um, depending on how you, you, you organize the data in the, in, the, in the sorting phase, you may or may not have to read memory from, from a, a remote Numa region. And that can, will, will affect performance as well. So again, for, to do the merge, we're just going to iterate over the outer table and the inner table and uh, do comparisons of, of each element uh, based on their join key. We never have to backtrack on the outer table. We may have to backtrack on the inner table if there's duplicates, right? Um, so as we'll see in a second, we can do this, this merging process entirely in parallel uh, if there's no synchronization between the output buffers of each thread. Um, but of course, then we said that if you, if you need to produce a, a coalesced result to the next operator in your query plan, somebody's going to have to go through and combine all these things together. So it's like, you either have everyone write to a shared buffer and use latches or compare and swap to protect each other, or you just let them write to their private buffers, but then you get to take another pass and combine them again. Yes? Sorry, just one uh, question about the sorting phase. The last, uh, this, this one? Yeah. So every core will have the output of the, the, the kind of list. Yes. And then after all the cores have done their work, then you have to combine them in global order? Uh, depending on how you're actually... Uh, no, we'll see in a second. This this can be all. This is this could be a globally sorted list of all runs within a single core. And depending on how you you, we'll see. Let me, let me go through the actual algorithms. You may shuffle things around so that yes, they're sorting glo locally, but then all cores are globally ordered. We'll, we'll, we'll see an example. All right. So I want to talk about. Uh, Three different sort merge join algorithms. So the first two are from the, the paper you guys read from ETH, right? the multi-way sort merge and the multi-pass sort merge. And then the last one here is from the hyper guys, the massively parallel sort merge, which again, they claimed was in 2012, was the best way to do join algorithms, but then they abandoned it. Um, and then the ETH paper will show how it gets crushed. Um, all right, so the multi-way multi sort merge is basically everything I've talked about so far. Right? You're going to use the cache-conscious sorting of the three different levels, and then you'll have a merge phase at the end that uh, just combines everything. So what's going to happen is on the outer table, again, you use the, 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 the each core is going to sort the data in parallel for level one and two, and then you're going to redistribute your data uh, in level three to spread things around so that you end up with a globally sorted list. And then on the inner table, you're essentially going to do the same thing. So then what will happen is when you actually do the merge, at each core, all you need to do is just look at the data that's local to your, to your core, and you don't need to look at anybody else. So visually, it looks like this. So say this is our outer table, right? So at, when we start off, we're completely, completely, completely unsorted. So we're going to do local pneumo partitioning, which is just the, the morsel stuff where we don't, we're not looking at the data. We just know things are divided up in blocks or morsels, and every core knows that it's responsible for the data that's local to it. So in the first step, we're going to do our uh, level one, level two sorting. And then we end up with, uh, at each NUMA region or each core, we have our locally sorted data. And then now we do the multi-way merge, where every single core is going to write out the data within a particular range to uh, one core. So in this case here, for some, some range of data, everybody's going to say, all right, I'm going to write my data to, the, to this, this buffer here. Right, and then you can do the, uh, the multi-way merge sort to again, make sure that these are now uh, locally sorted for all the data that, that you've combined here. And you'll do this for, for, every single, uh, for every single range written out to every, every partition. So now what you have is you have a, essentially a globally sorted uh, list uh, or globally sorted keys for, for the, the entire data set. And then now on the, on the, on the inner table side, you're going to do exactly all the same steps, but I'm not going to show them because we're running out of space. So I'll just say this sort box here represents 
all of this part here that we that we did. So it's going to end up also too with the same uh, uh, globally sorted list that's divided up into partitions per uh, per core. So now what needs to happen is all we have to do is, is a local merge join where just at each core, it's only going to compare the data that is is at its core, right? So your two iterators are going to scan down, and it's only doing a comparison sort of cross horizontally at a single core. It doesn't need to look at anybody else. Yes. Basically, like a range partition. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, this is range partition. Yes. And then how do you ensure that it's, it's balanced? balanced? Yeah. yeah. So his question is, back here. Uh, before we got here, I have these locally sort of lists. There's an extra step where you need to go through and say, well, what does the data actually look like? Uh, so that you want to divide it up evenly so that the, the number of tuples you have per, per core is, is, is the same. Now, maybe in the worst case scenario, you could have one, you know, you have a billion tuples that all have the same join key. And then the, you, you're essentially screwed. And, and in that case, you just you know, throw, throw your hands up and just let it go anywhere, right? OK, so the, the, the next one is the, from the ETH paper, again, is, is the multi-pass sort merge. Um, and this is just the same thing that I showed you in the multi-way sort merge, except that uh, you're not going to do the, the level 3 uh, re redistribution before you go into level 3. So you'll do the same level 1 and 2 sorting, um, and then you just do what's called naive merge on the sorted runs. Uh, where you don't really care where the data is actually uh, being stored. And you do the same thing on the outer table. So the idea now when you do the merge is that you have to check the, you basically know that I have a chunk of data on my, on my inner table, and I know where that chunk of data is in my outer table. I know where to go find it, but I don't try to localize my access. So it's essentially, think of like doing the same thing we did here, except that you don't have this extra phase here where you're, you're redistrib redistributing. So when this guy wants to do a lookup to find a matching tuple, it knows it just has to go scan at any possible core. Uh, so I probably should make a visualization for that, but that's fine. All right. So then we get to the last one from the hyper guys. So what they're going to do on the outer table, they're going to re do range partitioning the same way we did for the first joint sort merge algorithm. Um, and they're going to redistribute all the data to the different cores. And then with each, at each core, they're going to do a sort in parallel uh, so that they have a, you know, a, a locally sorted partition. But then on the inner table, you don't do this at all. You just sort your local data. And then you know how to, again, jump to the different locations and do your scans or do your lookups for the, all the, the, the sorted runs on, on the outer table here. Right? So here's the visualization of this. So again, we just take our, 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 our morsels, our blocks of data, and we're going to move all the data around to, uh, to do our partitioning. So we're not doing any sorting yet. We're just doing sort of the, you know, the radix partitioning, the hash partitioning to divide things up. And then within these, we do sorting. So again, this is not uh, globally sorted, right? It's just sorted across within a single NUMA region. And then on the, the inner table side, we don't, do, we don't do that repartitioning at all. We just again do our local sorting on the data that we have. So now when we want to do our join, we have to do this cross-partitioning join because we don't know whether the match for the tuple in the inner table can be found at you know, which of these guys here. So you essentially are doing, uh, uh, sort of as you do a sequential scan on the inner table, you have to possibly do a sequential scan for the entire, tu the entire uh, block in the outer table. Right? And you do this for, for all of them, one by one. Right? So, so the same thing for, for all the other ones here. So again, the, this, you're doing all these sequential scans uh, on, the, on these, these outer relations, but they argue that because it's sequential access, that the hardware can recognize that it's sequential access, and the hardware prefetcher can kick in and start pulling the data you need from the, the, the remote core to your local core, so that hides all the latency you have from these, these, you know, the, the non-local NUMA, uh, non NUMA memory access. Does everyone know what hardware prefetching is, or no? 
So hardware prefetching is if it's, it's on the CPU. If it recognizes that and you're reading a, a bunch of contiguous memory regions, then it's, it assumes you're going to keep going and starts pulling those the, the things you haven't read yet into like your L3 cache. We'll see this. There's a technique also called software prefetching, where it's essentially the same thing, and you can provide hints to the CPU and say, I'm going to read this data, so go ahead and read it for me ahead of time. And we'll see how we do this in Peloton, uh, but this one, this one they're explicitly doing hardware prefetching. All right, so uh, Hyper in their paper, they have a rule, some rules that they say are necessary in order to have good performance in a parallel sort merge drone algorithm. Um, so the first thing they're going to say is that you should never have any uh, random writes to non-local memory. So in their case, they're doing sequential reads to, to local memory, but all the writes, meaning when you actually sort the data, right, uh, are, those are always being done locally, right? And so in this case here, except for this, this first phase here, this will be uh, random writes to non-local memory, but everything else that comes after that is all going to be uh, uh, localized, right? These are just doing, uh, these are doing sequential reads, not writes. So you pay a penalty in the beginning, but you don't need to do it uh, later on. The next thing I'm going to claim is that you only want to perform sequential reads anytime you have to read local data or non-local data, and that's what they're doing in, in the merge phase. And then, again, the same issue that we had for the hash join, you never want to have to have any synchronization primitives that require one core to get blocked on another core. Everybody can always be running uh, in, in, in parallel. They may block because of a cache miss, but they're not blocking and wait, waiting to acquire a latch. From, from another thread. All right, so go through the evaluation real quick. Um, so for this, they're gonna compare the, 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 the multi-way, the multi-pass, and the massively parallel sort of algorithm. And then the, the ETH guys are also gonna throw in Radix partitioning, uh, the Radix partitioning hash join from, from, from last class and see how that compares against uh, these other approaches. And they're going to run on a, a much more beefier machine than we had last time. We have a four-socket Xeon machine with, with a half a terabyte of DRAM. So the first thing they want to evaluate is just how their uh, SIMD sort, sorting algorithm, what we showed, the, the, the three-level approach, how that compares against the, the, you know, the STL sorting algorithm you get in C++. So STL sort, as of at least last year, uses a hybrid sort, so they do quick sort at the very beginning, and then when you have uh, you know, larger uh, sorted runs, then they switch over and do heap sort. And they claim that, get, that gets the best performance in most cases. So they're comparing here, they're scaling up along the, uh, the x-axis, the number of tuples that, that, they're, uh, or that they're, they're trying to uh, sort. And this is running on, on a single thread. So what you see is that the SIMD sort for large, smaller data sizes, get, gets the best performance, but overall, it's about 2.5 to 3x faster than STL sort. Again, what I like about this experiment is that this essentially this, this corroborates the previous paper from Intel that showed they got about a 3.5x improvement uh, in their sorting algorithm when, when you use SIMD. So this this matches matches actually very very nicely. So now we can do a comparison of the of the the join algorithms. Um, well, actually, so yeah, this is a comparison of the join algorithms for doing sort merge, but it's going to be broken down based on the different phases. So we have the partitioning, the sorting, the sort merge, and the merge join part, and then we'll measure throughput separately. So in, the way to understand this, this is the, the merge phase of the sorting algorithm, and then this is the merge phase of, of the join algorithm, right? So along the y-axis here, we're going to show the... Uh, the, the number of cycles expended in order to produce a tuple in our output, and then along the other y-axis, it's just throughput. So in this case here, uh, for cycles, lower is better because you want to use less cycles, and then throughput is higher because it means you're, doing, you're, you're generating more, more output. So the first thing to point out here is that uh, they're essentially all paying the same penalty to do partitioning, right? There's no, there's no magic that makes one algorithm work better than another. They all produce the, you know, it all takes the same amount of time. But the, uh, the multi-way uh, join algorithm actually does the, much, much the best. The hyper one actually does terrible. And actually, if you plot throughput here, you, this is another way to, to observe it. So this is producing more tuples out, outputted using less cycles than what the, 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 the hyper guys can do. And the reason is because uh, 
they're trying to again be conscious about how they're doing uh, sorting in their caching, and they're being conscious of their caches as they do sorting. Um, and then when you actually do the the uh, well, in, in the sorting phase here, the the multi-way merge part ends up being um, it's this part here. The multi-way merge part, although you're again executing more instructions because you have your threads jumping around. Uh, it ends up again doing less cycles because you have a nice balance of your hardware resources, right? And it makes actually the the the, the join part actually is is really fast because you're just comparing against data within within the single core. All right, so when you compare again the the multi-way join versus the hyper join, in this experiment they're showing how these things are affected by uh, uh, by hyper threading. So this is a synthetic workload. They're trying to do uh, the outer table has 6 billion tu 1.6 billion tuples. The inner table has 128 million tuples. And so what you want to see here is the, the x-axis I'm showing in logarithmic scale. So the, the, what you want to happen is you want the uh, throughput to double as you double the number of threads. And for up until uh, maybe around here, they're all achieving that. But then when you get to, to eight threads, then the performance actually, uh, in the case of the hyper example, starts to fall off, um, right? So they're going from 54, uh, 54 million tuples per second to 90 million tu tuples a second, even though they double the number of uh, cores or threads. In the case of the ETH, multi-way sort merge, they're basically doing double. And of course, when hyper threading kicks in, those aren't really th you know, real threads. So now there's contention on the CPU caches and other things, and so it's no surprise that the performance uh, doesn't scale the same way. So this is showing you that the, again, that the, the, the extra instructions we have to use to do the jumping around in level three for the multi-way merge sort, sort merge, uh, it ends up being uh, a benefit for us because we, 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 we're, we're having less stalls and we're, we're wasting less cycles to process things. All right, so the, the next experiment we're going to show is actually, again, throw in hash join into the mix and do a comparison. So for this, I'm just combining the build and probe phase into the, in, into, into the same mix. So the, the, the only one that's really sort of worth looking at here is, again, hash join is always going to be much faster. Um, they didn't do a comparison when they, when they don't have the partitioning phase. The one that's interesting is here. Um, where the hash join is almost as slow as the sort merge join. And this is because they're, they're joining two really large tables, right? 1.6 billion tuples is, is a lot. Uh, and you see that there's this huge penalty for paying in, in the hash join case of doing, the, the, uh, of doing that partitioning. So, uh, yeah, so they, the main takeaway here is, again, just the hash join always does better. But in this case here, because partitioning is a, is a big overhead, uh, that's why we go much slower. So what would be nice to know is what does this graph look like when you don't do partitioning? All right, and then the last one here, is, again, we just want to show uh, how, how we, we vary the size of, of the number of tuples when we do our join. What is the cutoff point where these things actually meet? So again, here, the radix, when you do radix hash join, when you have a smaller table, it's much faster. But then as you increase the... Uh, as you increase the number of tuples you got to deal with, it gets slower. But in the case of the sort merge join, the performance essentially is sort of roughly the same. Um, and this is because we know we're not going to be uh, nicely in our CPU caches, but we can have the most efficient way of actually ha handling that when you have really large tables. So any questions about the sort merge at a high level? Yes? Multicast sort merge join, like spends less, spends more time in partitioning. Like, Why? Yeah, like, like, and you said it's because the first one is. The, the multipass, the, the partitioning time is always the same here for all, all, all of these. Oh, sorry, the soft phase. What's that? The soft phase. The soft phase. Like, what, why, is, why is the sort phase larger? Yeah, why is the soft phase in MPAS is like, looks larger than M? Uh, this versus this? Yeah. I, I think they look roughly the same. I, I, I have to check the number. <laughs> yeah, no, it's the same, but like, multi-pass spans one less round of like, sorting comparisons. Right, but then you pay that penalty 
uh, when you want to merge everything together. Yeah, but let's look at the source rate so long, and why does it like uh, take more time than multi rate while like uh, running mass phases of the source? The question is why is why is this red bar yeah. bigger than this red bar? Or, or roughly the same. Why is it roughly the same? Yeah, but well, while like they sort less wrongs. They sort less wrong, right? So let's go back here. Because multipaths only sort like level one, level two. While multiway, like half work. By the way, salt bridge has one more sort. Than like multi right? Oh, yeah, I'm not not following your question. Sorry. I think maybe you're confusing the merge sort and the sort charge. Yeah. Okay. So his statement is yeah. We we can take this online, but like the sorting phase of the sort merge drawing algorithm does merge sort, as described here. You could use quick sort. But we're using merge sort. Okay, let's, let, we'll, we'll come out. All right. Um, yeah, any question or no? Okay. Um, I can't jump to a slide. Okay, it's, it should be the view. Okay. All right. Uh, so to finish up, we're out of time. Um, the, as I said, the, the, you know, the, sometimes you want to use sort merge join when you know the, the, the data need to be, needs to be sorted in the same way that you want to do your join. Uh, I actually don't know how often that happens, um, and I suspect it's probably not as common as maybe the textbook says. Uh, and this is why most systems will just always do hash join. Um, but every single major OLAP database system, as far as I can tell, they all usually support both. Like Teradata supports both of these. Um, Exadata supports both of these. And it's up to the optimizer to figure out which of these algorithms it actually wants to use. Um, but in practice, the, uh, you know, the optimizer is almost always probably going to pick a hash join here. Um, the, if now you actually, if you, if you just want to sort the data, you can use the the you know big sort, sorting sorting networks that we talked about before the merge networks like that first phase of the sort merge join algorithm is still applicable if you have an order by clause so just because again we may not actually want to use a sort merge join instead of a hash join you, if you have an order by clause you're going to probably want to use the 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 simd simd vectorized uh, sorting algorithm that we talked about today okay all right, so um, we're out of time, but I'll I'll cover next week on Monday. Actually, no wait. Now, actually, let's let's actually go through this now because Wednesday we have no class. Monday, you guys have to give a uh, presentation, and then uh, your code reviews are due on um, on that Wednesday. So let me go through this now. Actually, okay. So as I said, everyone for Project Three has to send a pull request. Uh, you can do it to the master branch, but that, that'll kick off a build on Travis for you automatically. Um, if you just want to do it between each other, that's fine, but you, sh you should set up Travis, which is free to do, so that it'll actually build your, uh, build your PR and see that actually, you know, it actually passes all the tests. Um, it also, if you, if you actually send it to the, the, master, the master branch for us, we won't merge it. You can tag it as do not merge. You'll also get the, the coverage calculation for free as well, right? So, your code should never, the coverage should never go like down. It should always be going, staying the same or going up. Modulo, like, you know, some small percentage points, which has to do sort of uh, non-determinism, how we do certain things. Um, and then what you need to do is that make sure you put your, the, the URL to your pull request on the Google spreadsheet so that I can see it. And then the, on GitHub, the reviewing group can, can just go add comments into the, to, as part of the code review. Like there's actually an option in, in, in in GitHub is a performer code review, and it has a nice bookkeeping for all of this. So some quick general tips about how you should do this. Uh, so these are tips that I found on the internet. Um, take them for whatever, whatever you want. Uh, I don't always follow these, but I think, I think it's, it's useful at least to say that there's some guidelines you can think about as you do this. Um, 
So when you submit your pull request, you don't want to say, you know, in your, in your comment on GitHub, here it is, right? You should actually provide a summary that says, at a high level, what are the files you change? What are the functions you change? Like, what should, you, what do you want the other team to look at? Like, if you made it, if you made a bunch of changes that's not ready to be reviewed, you know, don't have the other team waste their time looking at that. Focus their attention. Say, this is what this is what we want feedback on. And in general, as you're doing your code review, you want to make sure that you kind of only look about 400 lines at a time, and don't look at this, you know, for more than 60 minutes because otherwise, you're just your eyes start to bleed, and you're not really absorbing anything, and you're not going to have uh, a really good feedback. Uh, that you can provide to their team. And I think it's also helpful to go into this with a checklist to decide ahead of time about what you're actually going to be looking for. So some general things, obviously, are is the code, does the code work? You would know this if it could, actually can build and run on, uh, on Travis or on your local machine. Is the code you're reviewing, is it actually easy to understand? You know, make sure they're not du duplicating code or copying much to replaces. You know, standard software engineering things like we don't want any global variables. We want to avoid singletons as much as possible, even though I know we have a bunch of them in our own code. We're going to get rid of them in the summer, but try not to add any new ones. Um, you should not have any you know, large chunks of common net code. And then you don't want, uh, you don't want to have any printf statements. And again, this is something that if you run this on Travis, there'll be a code review checker to make sure you don't invoke printf or fprintf or you know, standard or C out. Right? So everything should be using our built-in uh, log uh, debug methods. Is there documentation to make sure that uh, the, the, there's the code is actually written as the way that the comment said this is going to do it? Right? Um, you want to have Javadoc, uh, for all, Javadoc style uh, comments for all your functions. And again, we, we can provide you with, uh, we have a write-up somewhere that says what, what, what these should look like. Um, then if you have anything that's super bizarre, like it's a tricky part of the code, you should always be clearly define what the hell is actually going on. Um, if you have any third-party libraries, try to document where they are and what they're doing and why do we need them. As far as I know, nobody in the class, except for some people doing the self-driving stuff, need to bring in any third-party libraries. So this hopefully shouldn't be an issue. And again, if you have code that you know is not finished, you know, it should have proper to-do flags and make sure that, you know, that it's clear that the thing is not finished. Um, and what needs to happen to actually make it be finished. Everyone should be having uh, test cases for all their code. As I said, the cover should always be going up. It should never be going down. But your test cases should actually be meaningful, meaning like that, oh, it, it ran without crashing, so that's my test case, and I, I'm, I'm good, right? Or in some previous years, we've had students just print things to standard out. Then they look when they run it and say, oh, that's the output I expect, and they think that they're done. Of course, the problem with that is no one's going to do that when it runs on you know, nightly tests. So you need to have real test cases that actually check the, the, the out, whether the output is correct, not just that it printed something, printed something to the terminal. Um, try to also avoid having hard-coded answers in your tests. Uh, again, maybe I'll send an email out and say, here's some good test cases that we, you should try to emulate. Uh, there's some bad ones in there. And, and you don't want to keep propagating bad code. But try to avoid having things that are hard-coded uh, so that if we go change logic in some part of the system, that all of a sudden, like it doesn't break your test cases, and we don't understand why, right? So one example of this would be someone hard coded that the the tuple they inserted would be at a certain offset in the block, which depends on what was already inserted before, and depends on how we're actually inserting things. So when we modified how we actually store our tile groups, then all the hard coded tests failed, right? All right. So any questions about this? I'll I'll send an email out with some additional guidelines, and maybe send some examples about where to write the test cases, and. Also say that there, you can write C++ test cases, and you can also write Java test cases. The Java test cases should be for high-level things because you're going through a SQL interface. If you want to test low-level stuff, it should be written in C++. Yes? Should you be doing a rebase before the pull request? This question is, should you be doing a rebase before you, before you do a pull request? Absolutely, yes. I think there's instructions on the wiki. If you can't figure it out, then we, we can help you. OK? All right, so again, no class on Wednesday. Uh, if you haven't signed up yet, I think everyone did, but if you haven't signed up yet for a meeting time on Wednesday, please do that. Um, and then you have to submit your code, first code review on Wednesday night, uh, doing all the steps that I said before. Okay? Any questions?
Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting Too cold a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson One court and my thoughts hip-hop related Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker Rhymes I create rotate at a rate Too quick to duplicate, fill a breeze as I skate Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight When I'm in flight, then we ignite Blood starts to boil, I heat up the party for you let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Records still turn with third degree burns for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off with St. Ives